Aloha and welcome everyone. This is our third segment, <coughs> our third workshop segment featuring Danny Paradise. Present Danny Paradise. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. <laughs> it's a, an honor for me to be here. I'm really glad that Prem and Radha invited me. I, I feel very honored that you did. And of course, uh, it's fantastic to be with my first teacher, David Williams, and to be with Manju, and just to honor the lineage of Ashtanga Yoga and Yoga. Uh, I was very fortunate because I was in an early group to learn these practices. Um, unfortunate, that makes me older. <laughs> but uh, it was a great gift just to be in the right place at the right time without knowing anything about yoga and being drawn into it. Uh, as I mentioned the other night by my friend Cliff and having the incredible opportunity to learn yoga outside, in nature. Um, so I'm going to talk about various things. They're, it's just my opinions, my views from exploring um, these practices and also having an amazing opportunity to get into Amazonian shamanism and since 1991. Um, at some point, uh, I'll open it to questions, things that might come up. So anything that comes to mind, feel free to ask, and um, we can have an open discussion as well. Um, I started traveling after I learned yoga in 1982. I began in 1976, and uh, first I came to actually came to California in 1979 and, and started teaching uh, a little bit. I introduced the forms in Los Angeles at the Center for Yoga through my old friend Ganga White. Um, so uh, that was my beginning of, of teaching outside of Hawaii. Uh, I mentioned the other day that uh, I highly recommend if you're interested in teaching to teach by invitation. I never planned on teaching yoga. I still don't have a plan. <laughs> um, what I'm going to be when I grow up. But uh, you know in the meantime, when people invite me, I try to honor that invitation and, and show up. Um, there was something I wanted to mention. You know, David was talking yesterday about uh, how there's a million people maybe doing Ashtanga yoga around the world, but you, you don't give yourself enough credit or Manju or Patabi Joyce or Krishnamacharya. There's millions of people doing yoga because of this lineage. Uh, maybe you came into yoga because of uh, Hatha yoga or flow yoga or power yoga or any number of explorations that are derivatives of Ashtanga yoga. Ashtanga yoga was, you know, is the most concentrated form of yoga. I think that's why we all are so drawn to it because of the, the incredible vitality and cr it, it, it creates and the... Uh, the empowerment that it gives, and the healing force that it creates. Um, and all these other forms developed out of Ashtanga Yoga. Uh, Jiva Mukti Yoga, those guys studied Ashtanga Yoga and then created their own form. Flow Yoga was Ganga White, he studied Ashtanga Yoga. Before um, Ashtanga Yoga appeared in the West, People went to Hatha yoga classes, Most, mostly it was elderly people. You would do a pose and then lie down for a while. <laughs> and then get up after a while and do another pose and lie down. <laughs> I still do that sometimes. <laughs> Quite often, in fact. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that it was Ashtanga yoga that opened the door to concentrated yoga practices and introduce the, the real power of breath and the, the power of internal locking, protecting yourself through deep practice and the idea of detoxifying the body for, by creating heat and boosting the immune system. I remember my first class. Everybody remembers their first Ashtanga class, right? Very shocking. <laughs> in my first salutation, I was in the downward dog. 
15 seconds into the practice and I broke out into an intense sweat. Nothing had made me sweat before after 10 or 15 seconds. And I, I, in that first downward dog, I went, oh my God, what's going on here? This is something totally different. I could feel ligaments and tendons, nerves, things I never knew I had. So, uh, you know, and it carried on from there. But that was really my first introduction to the, the beauty and the power of this. When you practice Ashtanga Yoga, or any form of yoga, but especially Ashtanga Yoga, you're going to learn what old people's yoga is. Maybe you already learned. You're going to wake up some days and feel like you're 95 years old and were, was run over by a truck and never did yoga. That happened to me numerous times. And then it becomes Hatha Yoga. Like Manju said, it's all just yoga. If you can do a constant, deeper concentrated form, great. But on some days you're going to have to soften your approach. I don't think it ever looks the same. You know, you may be learning a form that has an ideal, but every day you do it, it's totally different. You've already noticed that. And you have to approach it with what's appropriate for that day. And uh, Manju mentioned the other day when he was talking, if you're not concentrated, you lose concentration. It, it becomes dangerous if you carry on. You have to stop. You might do 10 minutes of yoga someday and realize you have to finish that day because you don't have the energy or you're not clear or you're not concentrated. If you carry on, then you endanger yourself. So you have to pay very close attention every day to what's happening to you because this puts you through endless changes. I've been doing this form for th since 1976. It's still new every day and I still have to pay very close attention to what's going on each day your structure changes. I came into yoga with uh, poor posture. I'd been uh, playing music since I was 12 years old, kind of hunched over a guitar. So when they met me, I was kind of like this. <laughs> so obviously, you know, uh, things radically altered because yoga gives you the structure that you're designed to have through your genetics, but you may not have it because you've been Im imitating your parents or playing guitar or just not concentrating on good structure, genetic structure, or p great posture. But yoga forces your, you into great structure it, and it creates enormous changes. As you've already noticed, I'm sure, your bone structure changes. I, I've seen many, everybody who carries on these practices, their sternum opens up and extends forward. They, they get straight. Um, Ligaments, tendons, nerves, muscles, everything goes through changes. Every joint in your body is going to go through a change. Maybe you've already seen that in your own practices. Certainly, I've seen it in my practice. I, I can only speak from my experience, and of course, I've been teaching for a long time, so I've been watching lots of people go through these practices and see the changes, emotional, physical, spiritual, so when your structure changes, you're going to go through some aches and pains. Sometimes they're going to be minor, sometimes they're going to be major. Uh, I have woken up numerous times and, and felt very old. <laughs> and on those days, I honored that. I was, I'm perfectly happy to do a soft yoga practice and to do, do it in a way that needs to be done that day. And Recognizing, as David has mentioned in the class and all these other teachers too, uh, you, you need to avoid pain in the practice. Pain is your indication that you're going through some healing processes. So you modify positions when necessary. So as soon as you, you have an indication of pain, you back off. And gradually that pain will disappear. I, I'm totally pain free today. But over the years, I've gone through many healing processes, sometimes taken a, a day, sometimes taken two or three years. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, so I've tried to honor that when I teach and when I practice, recognizing that this is all about healing primarily. That's the initiation of as I feel with the practices of yoga. It's about healing. And that's the essence of shamanism, too. Yoga is a shamanic practice. When I first came to the realization that yoga was embedded in shamanism and shamanism was embedded in yoga, I started looking deeper into that idea. 
the first, when I, I woke up one morning after having initiation ceremonies in the Amazon, completely different culture, native cultures, uh, that initiated me into deep trance meditation, communication with the spirit, healing process, recognizing that I could communicate with the spirit whenever I wanted without any kind of ceremony, just sitting quietly and having, creating a communication. Yeah, I think, you know, once you begin these processes, you recognize that you're involved in something very ancient, much older than 5,000 years old. You ever, you ever taken a look at everything that's 5,000 years old? Yoga, the pyramids, uh, the Kabbalah, uh, the I Ching, um, everything seems to be 5,000 years old. Something was happening one day 5,000 years ago that was really amazing. <laughs> Everything started then. But actually, if you go a little deeper and you look, really start looking into these things, you can discover that you're involved in a process that's been around since the beginning of humanity. So Ashtanga Yoga, the sequences of Ashtanga Yoga weren't around, but yoga has been around since the beginning of time. The desire to communicate with the spirit, the idea that you can heal yourself, that you can empower yourself, that you can fulfill your personal destiny, create your destiny. That's one of the definitions of yoga. I remember reading that by Krishnamacharya. Fulfilling personal destiny. So what does that really mean? That means creating yourself, creating your dream. The yogis are dream masters. The shamans are dream masters. You're all involved in a process that is not a spectator sport. Once you walk in the door, you're in it. You've entered into a shamanic field where the spirit is recognized. Whether you, you, nobody can define what God is. You have a personal definition and a personal means of communication. You create that yourself, not based on religious texts or scriptures. You can read that, those things and see how other people define it and approach it. But ultimately, it's a personal, private connection. Just like yoga becomes a personal, private practice, ultimately. We learn in groups, and the, the group energy is phenomenal, and classes, and that's a beautiful experience. But ultimately, it's what you do on your own that's going to determine if you're a yogi, and if you've really started to understand these practices. So, shamanism is this understanding that nature is the spiritual guide and teacher. Yoga recognizes that. Yoga understands, where yoga, the definition of yoga, as I said, one of them is fulfilling personal destiny. Recognizing that through empowerment, through healing yourself, through creating some vitality and energy, you can change your life circumstances if necessary. If you're not happy, in what you're doing in your life, in your relationships, or your work. If work doesn't recognize your gifts, and your talents, and your dreams, then you may need to radically alter what your perception of work is, what you feel that your work is on the earth. If your relationships don't honor that, same thing. You have to if you feel, change circumstances as quickly as possible. Or you can hold on to situations that you're not happy with, problems, circumstances for lifetimes. Or change it instantly. So by coming into these practices and creating new vitality, new clarity, new energy, it gives you the opportunity to change your life circumstances and manifest a radical new dream if you want. <clears throat> if you're struggling with your health and disease and deteriorating rapidly, which happens, you know, 19 years old is considered the peak in human uh, f physical, the physical realm. If you're not doing yoga or these other arts from the East, whether it's 
martial arts, qigong, uh, tai chi, kung fu, wushu, all these things are healing forces at first and then they initiate radical changes in perception. So one of the things I like to talk about is uh, the Native Americans, their perception, Native American Indians. They say that if you need energy, all you need to do is walk outside and take a deep breath. So it doesn't come from other people. It comes from nature. Now the yogis took that a step further. They said, let's explore breath on its deepest levels possible and see what really happens when you learn to, to increase your capacity and bring in as much oxygen into your system as you possibly can. When you go for a walk in nature or do yoga and breathe deeply, you're initiating a trance, a light trance. You're moving from a regular waking state, which is beta. You've all heard of beta state. Beta is regular waking. 32 pulses a second, waves of energy that are moving through your brain. When you start, like I said, when you go for a walk in the forest, or you sit under a tree, or you do yoga, you're moving from a beta state to an alpha state. You're initiating a slower brainwave pulse that allows increases in perception because you're slowing yourself down. You're allowing yourself to go into deeper levels of attention and concentration. At the end of a yoga class, when you lie down in Shavasana and you really allow yourself to rest for 10 or 15 minutes, you move into the theta state, slower brainwave pulse. And in that state, that's the healing state, in deep rest. So within two or three min minutes of uh, Shavasana, you'll notice, if you're just observing, that you sink into this deeper level of relaxation, where you're completely energized, but you're totally relaxed. And then, more often than not, the longer I do yoga, the more it happens, when I really allow myself to rest in Shavasana, I go into a lucid dreaming state in that 15 minute rest. And you sink into this deep, almost ecstatic state because you've done this work on yourself. And then all the energy and vitality that you created in that practice works for healing. And if you get up after a yoga practice and immediately do something, eat or take a shower or, or do whatever your business is, um, nothing's, nothing radical is going to happen, but you're not allowing that healing force to activate in your body. So the sh Shavasana is one of the most important positions. In a deeper trance state, which you can see in Bali and in India and in ceremonies, I don't know if you've, anybody's gone to any of the trance ceremonies that they offer to, for guests of the island and some of the temples here, but that, they're demonstrating the delta trance. There's a, one priest here that every other night, he, uh, they do this beautiful ceremony, a gamelan orchestra, um, prayers, dance, and then the priest comes out on a magical horse, a wooden horse. He's in complete trance, and he hangs out in fire. He doesn't just run across fire. He hangs out in the fire. Anybody seen that ceremony yet? It's happening every other night in Ubud. And it's this amazing character who demonstrates this deep delta trance. And the Indonesians, uh, the, the Philippine, Filipinos, uh, Indians from the subcontinent of India are, are masters of the, the delta trance. Um, being able to go into this state where they can't be harmed by fire, uh, they can't be in, injured. It's, it's a kundalini trance, the delta trance. It's the full awakening of consciousness. Kundalini, you know, you've heard that term for since the beginning of your yoga practices. Uh, kundalini is full awakened consciousness. 
It's the release of the strongest psychoactive chemical in your body into your brain. Everybody's carrying that chemical. It's called DMT, dimethyltryptamine. Everybody has it. Everybody goes through that awakened state <clears throat> at birth, at death, and in deep crisis, sometimes high fever, uh, sometimes in states of fasting or meditation or pranayama is a deep, pr deep pranayama is a technique that initiates kundalini. And by the way, kundalini is A Mayan term. The Mayans of Central America say Kundalini is a 100,000 year old teaching or recognition of this trance state from their culture. They call it Kuthalini. Kuthalini in the Mayan culture has the same metaphor as in yoga and Sanskrit and the Indian culture. It's the sleeping serpent at the base of your spine that rises up when you become awakened, when all your glands become empowered, when this chemical is released into your brain to allow you to see with the eyes of God. That's the force that's created. The, the theta state is a much softer trance, the lucid dreaming state. The delta trance is much more powerful. Um, Maybe you've, you're familiar with the Dalai Lama and his oracle. The Dalai Lama has a little old man that's his oracle. He's a skinny old guy. When, he, when the Dalai Lama needs some information about the future, they put this 75-pound hat on this little old shaman, and he goes into a delta trance and reveals the future. That's how the Dalai Lama knew exactly what day to leave Tibet so that he would make it safely into India, exiting and escaping from the invasion of the Chinese a couple of days ahead. So it was his oracle that told him what day to leave. And obviously it was very successful. It was, the guy told him the right moment. In, in all shamanism, you can know the future. Your soul knows the future. Your body represents the present. Your mind represents the past. The soul observes and knows. The body experiences and feels. The mind analyzes and remembers. Of course, the mind gets us into a lot of trouble with analysis, over-analysis. <laughs> so, Okay, so these are the states that can be created through many types of initiation ceremonies. Like I said, pranayama. They've recognized for tens of thousands of years that through breath, you can initiate these deep states of trance. I'm not ta we're not talking about when you go to a hatha yoga class and they do very light pranayama. It's pranayama that goes deeper and deeper that increases your lung capacity, boosts your immune system, brings you totally into the present, becomes a very deep meditation. And of course you build up to deep pranayama. It's not something you just learn right away. It's something you, just like the Ashtanga Yoga syllabus, you learn it step by step and gradually increase your strength and your concentration, your abilities. Okay, so all these initiation ceremonies have, have developed over the earth for tens of thousands of years. And remember I said kundalini is a, a Mayan term. So that changes everything. That if, they're, if they're saying, whether it's true or not, even if they just indicate that kundalini is a Mayan term and that it's, it's possibly as old as the human race, then that changes the age of yoga by... 95,000 years. <laughs> Anybody been to Egypt yet? Taking a look around the temple of Karnak or Luxor? Okay, if you've gone with 
a yoga guy, if you were already doing yoga when you went to Karnak, then you see yoga carved into the temples. I went there in 1986, uh, 87, 86 and 87, first time. I'd been doing yoga for 10 years. Um, I went with this amazing friend, a new friend in Egypt, who was very studied in Egyptology. He took me and my crazy friend Baptiste Marceau around the pyramids and then down to southern Egypt to Karnak and Luxor. And wandering around the temples, I suddenly saw spinal twists carved into the hieroglyphs, uh, lotus, um, shoulder stand, um, downward dog. It was all there. And he impressed upon me that also Egypt is not 5,000 years old. They don't know how old the monuments are. The people who have been studying it in detail say it's there, the Temple of Karnak, the Temple of Luxor are anywhere from 7,000 to 80,000 years old. They can't really date them. So you're possibly looking at 80,000 year old yoga positions carved into the temples of Karnak and Luxor. It's possible that the information arose simultaneously all over the world in Central America, in South America, in Egypt, in India, or they, they just exchange information. People were traveling since tens of thousands of years. There's not much evidence because not much evidence can last. But the evidence is in these old teachings that are all over the world. Um, you hang out with the Mayans of Central America, they say, hey, we invented yoga. <laughs> I, I, I feel yoga was refined in India. It was carried in India. You know, it, it arose in our current culture in India, but the origins are much, much older. Meditation is a common practice in all Native American, South American, and North American studies or, or rituals. They've been into meditation forever. They've understood the presence of the spirit, the sacred nature of existence. They've, they understand the human form as this incredible gift, a beautiful blessing. It's a temple that you are responsible for. If you misuse it, you pay the price. But if you learn to purify yourself, no, and nobody's perfectly pure, <laughs> Nobody can be perfectly pure, but if you work for purification, if you eat well, if you use ancient healing techniques that create purification and strengthen, boost vitality, give clarity of the mind, then, you're, then you receive more information. As the mind becomes more responsible, you're given more responsibility. So. That's really what we're up to here. It's a much more ancient process than we realize. And the other thing is the influence that you're going to have by just carrying on these practices. First of all, if you're, who teaches yoga? Any form of yoga? And who else is interested in teaching yoga maybe one day? Okay, well you never know what's going to happen. I ne like I said, I never had a plan. I don't think David planned on teaching yoga. Um, it just happened. And, and how it usually happens is you practice, your friends see something's going on. You're standing straighter, you're happier, <laughs> you quit your job, <laughs> <laughs> or they fire you because <laughs> you're always late for work because you're at your yoga class. <laughs> Prem said something I, I always say in my classes. The more yoga you do and the more pranayama you do, the more unemployable you become. <laughs> I always say it as a joke, but it's true. <laughs> what it means, though, is if you're not, like I said earlier, if you're not really satisfied in what you do, it becomes clear that there's another path. Like I said, the yogis are dream masters. Uh, so, people, your friends, your family, will just eventually say, hey, can you show me some yoga? 
even though they might ridicule you in the beginning and think you're crazy. Eventually, you know, a few years down the line, they're getting weaker and they see you're getting healthier and stronger. Remember David's story about Tatwala Baba, 79 years old and looked like he was 33 or 35. I'm, I'm 92. <laughs> I know, it's a shock. <laughs> I don't feel 92, though. <laughs> Some days I do. What? My father was 104 when he died one month ago. He was my yoga master, my first yoga master. He didn't do the practices of yoga, but he was an advanced yogi. I f you want to know if you're an advanced yogi? It doesn't have anything to do with asanas. It has to do with compassion, Kindness, tenderness, humor, lightheartedness, and probably a number of other things. Uh, asanas is down the, down the list. That's going to keep you healthy and vital, for sure. But if you want to know what's really going on, check out how compassionate you are, how empathetic you are, how you can, if you can look at somebody else and, and recognize yourself or, or see what they're going through or step into their shoes, then you're starting to become advanced in the explorations of consciousness. So, one of the definitions of shamanism also is that you heal yourself. You work on healing yourself, and then it spreads into your circle of friends and family. So if you want to know if it's working, like I said, eventually through time, your friends are going to actually ask you to show, you, show them yoga or, or turn you on to where you're learning. Turn them on to an, a teacher, a good teacher. And then from that initiation, from you practicing and influencing your, your circle of friends and family, it moves into the whole world. It spreads into the community. It spreads around the world. Like I said, you don't know what kind of influence you're going to have. These guys, Manju and David, Patabi Joyce, Krishnamacharya, they didn't know this was going to happen. That a grassroots movement amongst a small group of people was going to spread to tens of millions of people. That wasn't the plan. They, they, I'm sure we all thought when we were learning initially that this, was, this is amazing. This is amazing for humanity. And we hoped it would spread. And sure enough, it is. You know, if you look at the statistics of what's happening around the Earth these days, it's pretty frightening. Everybody knows. You can see. But if you look a little deeper and check out what positive things people are doing, whether it's teaching yoga or bringing yoga into slums or ghettos, organic agriculture, what's going on in colleges, eco ecological movements, people waking up. There is a mass movement happening. And actually, I met a friend, a new friend in Bali last March, Diogo, who, starts, who started the Boom Festival in Portugal. And, uh, he, we were having a conversation. He told me that at the Boom Festival, they started, I don't know, when did it start, the Boom Festival? About 10 years ago or something? Yeah, first it started as a small festival. Now they have like 30, 40,000 people coming. 70,000. 70, okay, so, you know, it's growing exponentially. Uh, they started, um, I think they had a slideshow of, of every group in the world. They just met... Uh, uh, show it on a screen that was doing something positive on Earth. At first they had a few thousand names of organizations and individuals. And then every year it, it kept growing. And now they, ha they say there's a billion people working in a positive way. That's pretty extraordinary working in slums, NGOs, trying to do positive things around the world, trying to manifest healing in communities, breaking out of poverty. 
So that's one in seven people. Maybe you're amongst them. You are if you're practicing yoga. You're influencing whether you know it or not. You're, some of you write or work in the media or teachers in public schools or colleges or, or doctors or lawyers or working as NGOs. You're having this phenomenal influence. You don't know how many people you're going to influence in your lifetime. I was very lucky because uh, I learned early when I st and I was very interested in traveling. I told you the other night I, I went around the world when I was 19. It was a, a, a dream. None of my friends had done it. Nobody in my community or family, but somehow I got I met somebody who was, had traveled to, I was born in Canada, I met somebody who had traveled to Europe in the summer and North Africa and then they'd stayed a year. And that sparked something in my imagination. Rather than just continuing in a cycle of school and college and work and depression, <laughs> I had this idea that I was going to travel the world. And of course, I wasn't, I was afraid of it. I was very afraid of just leaving. My parents were horrified. They said I was going to ruin my life. I, you know, I was going to destroy my, my future. But thank God I did it. And, you know, I, I left and went to Europe from Canada with the idea of going to Asia and carrying on. And uh, the first day I was really depressed. And I thought, oh shit, I have ruined my life. <laughs> I was isolated and lonely and uh, I was a little, you know, in shock. And then I, I went to a youth hostel and stayed at this youth hostel. And the first day I met a, a musician. I, was, I had my guitar with me. I played music since I was a kid. And suddenly I snapped out of it and, I, and he, we became friends and went to a park and started to play. And he sh started showing me all this fantastic music that he knew. And that was the end of my depression. And I was on my way. And it, it broke me free and allowed me to come to Southeast Asia and get completely turned on to the culture here and recognize that I, I wanted to come back no matter what. I met amazing characters on, on that journey, just like, just like you. People have been traveling all over the world. But back then, there was just a small group of people that had that idea all over the world, uh, or all over North America and Europe. You know, a small group of people where suddenly it became possible. There was cheaper airfares, people had a little money. Our parents couldn't do it. It was a new phenomenon. Now, you see what's happening. You can go anywhere in the world. You can do whatever you want. You can work all over the world. That didn't exist back then. It was isolated groups of people that came to India, as you heard David tell his story yesterday, on a magic adventure, people that came to Southeast Asia, people that came to Bali in the 70s and discovered an untouched culture, no tourism, uh, no cars, no pollution, no plastic bags, no place to stay. <laughs> You had to sleep on the beach. <laughs> or for 15 bucks in Goa, they build you a house. <laughs> a beautiful little, you know, uh, palm from and bamboo structure. Uh, it was an amazing time. But uh, now is also an amazing time. Um, but there's much more responsibility, I think, that's coming now. Because, you know, we've helped initiate this incredible pollution all over the world. We've allowed these chemical corporations to take over the world. There's no control of the chemical industry, the genetically modified food industry. They, as you all know, they manipulate governments, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the chemical corporations in particular, they set government policy through payoffs, through um, manipulation, coercion, big money, false science, falsified science, propaganda, 
pharmaceutical industry, the medical, uh, the genetically modified food industry, the chemical industries have billions of dollars for advertising. So they're manipulating people's thinking through the media. But once you're awakened, once you're conscious, once you start eating good food, organic food, you recognize what your body needs. You recognize what's important. And you recognize that you have responsibility, personal responsibility and personal authority. That's what I see yoga is about. Personal authority. There's no masters of yoga outside yourself. I, I don't claim to be a master of yoga. I, I don't think anybody here does that's been studying yoga. I think what we're, we're more experienced in yoga. You know, we have, I have 38 years experience. David has 43 or years. Manju has from the time he was a child. They're not claiming, as far as I see, mastery. They're just trying to pass on as much information as possible to make you the master. There's only one master of yoga that I've ever encountered. That's you. <laughs> Even the Buddha says, you are your only master. Who else? No one else is responsible for your purity or your purification. It's you. So you're learning techniques that have been passed down for thousands, tens of thousands of years to help you create mastery in your life. To help you manifest your magical dream. Remember the yogis were dream masters. That doesn't mean while they were sleeping. That means while they were living and awake and alive. Recognizing that the yogis are outside the regular order of society. It gives you a vision where you can step back and see more clearly and be a witness. And be a witness that you're a witness. And then you can be a witness that you're a witness that you're a witness. And so on. The yogis were anarchists, freedom thinkers. You're in the wildest tradition on earth. You remember David was talking about, in his story, about Krishnamacharya studying in a cave in the Himalayas. It wasn't a, heat, a heated central heating with, uh, you know, all the amenities of your hotel room. It was these guys living in radical nature. It was Tatwala Baba, dreadlocks down to the ground. You've been to, most of you have been to India. The people that were carrying the traditions of yoga for thousands and thousands of years were the Agori Sadhus, the Naga Babas. The guy's incredibly strong and, and amazing health. No work, no money. Living outside of society. Freedom thinkers. Advisors to the kings. Even in the, these days in the Himalayas, sometimes, if you're re hiking remote in the Himalayas, you find these groups of, of sadhus, sometimes living naked in the, the ice and snow, maybe hanging out by a fire. And then a helicopter comes in and lands. It's the Prime Minister of India coming for a little advice. <laughs> Checks in with them. They pass on their darshan. Gets back in his helicopter and flies back home. So this is the tradition you're in. Okay, now it's in yoga studios and gymnasiums. It's become, you know, acculturated. It's part of the culture. It's part of popular culture. But the origins are in these ancient shamanic yogis tuned into the plants, the plant medicines. Tuned into meditation, fasting, being able to live without food for periods of time if necessary. Owning nothing. Maybe a blanket and a bowl. Um, endless techniques, like I said, that have developed around the world to initiate radical, deeper consciousness. Maybe it was sweat lodge in North America, North and South America, 
to Mezcal in Mexico, sweat lodge. Anybody done a sweat lodge? Okay, I'm not talking about a sauna. <laughs> I did a sweat lodge a, a number of times, once with this amazing Native American named Red Cloud, a Native American elder. I'd done some sweat lodges with the, my hippie friends. That was different. This was a sweat lodge where it became a struggle, a life and death struggle. You know, if you're familiar with the sweat lodge, it's a, you know, a circular, maybe canvas structure, small, or it might be leaves and branches of a tree that cover it, a hole in the center. They bring in these hot rocks that have been sitting in a fire, put it in the center. You're sitting around, tight packed with a bunch of people. The guide or the, the elder is chanting, meditating, praying. They're throwing water and herbs um, on the hot rocks and gradually all the air disappears. Now you're allowed to leave, but they encourage you to stay. The air disappears. You go into a deep panic because that's what happens when there's no air. <laughs> you can't, there's nothing to breathe. Suddenly you have to, fortunately when I was there I could start to breathe very slowly and deeply, but I was still very nervous and terrified because it got deeper and hotter, less and less air, nobody was leaving. I was in there with Sting and Johnny Depp, so I didn't want to run out of the sweat lodge. <laughs> and at a certain point, suddenly, something transforms, and you move from this state of panic into another level of consciousness. You move into a near-death state. And in that particular condition, you suddenly you tune in to the elder that hasn't stopped praying or chanting. Sometimes in his language, sometimes in English. And you really suddenly, you're in an al a deep altered state. You moved into, you know, from the beta state to alpha to, to delta, or sorry, theta. And even possibly delta sometimes in those conditions. And then you're in this deeply altered non-ordinary reality, something much more powerful. And you're in communication with your soul. And you have a dialogue with your soul. And you can ask questions. You can communicate very clearly with the spirit. And the elder asks everybody to say something, if they wish. So people say a prayer, or they, they talk about their ancestors, or they relate some powerful experience in their lives, all in this very deep, altered state. So Sweat Lodge is one of those practices that's been around since the beginning of time to initiate evolutionary consciousness. Remember, evolution is a the growth of consciousness, the expansion of consciousness, of awareness. Evolution also means the discovery of truth. The truth is, you're unlimited, eternal, and free. Read the yoga scriptures. Look into it very deeply. You've been around forever. You're going to be around forever, whether you believe that or not. At the moment you make your transition, you'll recognize it's true. Even an atheist in crisis prays to God. <laughs> so, we're unlimited, eternal, and free. You've been here through eternity. We're in eternity. You recognize that by being fully conscious in the present. That's what asana teaches you. It's a metaphor for being in the present because you're doing this concentrated work that demands all your attention. You're trying to balance on one finger with your toe way up in the air. You can't be thinking about what's going on for dinner tonight 
or what happened yesterday. It brings you into the present. It's a technique for meditation. Like uh, as Manju said the other day, it's, it's meditation. It draws you into full attention in the present. That's the definition of meditation. Like Krishnamurti said, you're sitting in a room. If you're just sitting around and a, a snake walks into the room, you're not going to be thinking any, about anything else other than that snake. And your complete concentration is going to be on that snake. That's meditation. Full attention in the present. You can read endless books on meditation. There's as many techniques for meditation as there are human beings on the earth. <laughs> like the Sufi says, there, the, the Sufis say, there's as many roads as there's souls of men. There's as many paths to God as there's individuals on the earth. So you develop your own communication to the Spirit. Maybe that's the most important thing to learn. When you're before crisis, before you're in crisis, develop a regular practice of sitting quietly for a few minutes every day under a tree or in a nice space, a beautiful space, and ask for guidance or ask for information. That's meditation. It's as simple as that. And if you ask, you receive it. If you don't ask, you don't receive it. All it takes is asking. You don't have to define who you're asking or what you're asking. When you're doing this kind of practice, you're actually communicating with the heart of the universe. That's how powerful it is. And in my experience, every time I do that, especially when I need information or guidance, I receive it in a way that I don't expect. I might get a message, call David Williams, <laughs> which I have. <laughs> and he didn't know I got that message from meditation. But I called him and asked him a question. And he gave me the information I needed at the time. So you don't know where that, what that information is going to be until you ask for it. Or another great technique for meditation is just sitting quietly and counting your blessings in your life. All the gifts you've been given. This amazing time in history when you can travel the world, do anything, work anywhere, manifest your dream in a, in a way that wasn't possible for your parents or your grandparents. But in a way that's always been available. You know, yoga wasn't around everywhere 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Now, it's on every street corner in every city in the world, just about. I don't know if you realize this. There's 20 million people in mainland China practicing yoga now. This happened in the last six years. They're fast. <laughs> They're not all doing Ashtanga yoga, but some of them are. They're doing yoga. It's manifesting in all the major cities. There's 20 million people in North America. There is probably the same throughout Europe. When I started traveling in, uh, I told you, in 1982, I went to Goa. I was invited by Cliff, our crazy sadhu friend. Um, wild, heroic life who threw away his shoes when he was 35 or 36, stopped working walked out into the streets with nothing. And from that moment on, he was taken care of somehow. So our, friend, our crazy friend, Texas Jim, took him to India in 1978 or 79 after he learned uh, for several years with uh, David. And uh, also, Patabi Joyce had come to uh, Encinitas in 1978. Uh, that was my first experience meeting Guruji, and Cliff had come also. Um, and then Cliff went the next year with Texas Jim <laughs> to uh, India, and went 
to Mysore and studied yoga there with Guruji, carried on. Already he was, uh, as we mentioned, he was really old. He was 44, 45. <laughs> he learned all the sequences of Ashtanga Yoga at the time that were taught, the primary, intermediate, the advanced A and advanced B by the time he was 48 or 49. And then he came to Goa and had a huge class, international class, the first really major international class, probably 50 people every day outside in this ashram, Vagator Beach, kids, young people from all over the world, Iran, Afghanistan, people escaping from the, the Russians, the Russian invasion in Afghanistan, uh, Europeans, Israelis, uh, Indians, Pakistanis, it was this, uh, Australians, Americans, New Zealand, everybody was there. And more and more people coming every day. For, straight from the parties, the all-night parties. <laughs> Most of them were on acid when they came to the class. <laughs> that helps you learn, I suppose. They learn really quickly. <laughs> there was a lot of that going on. Uh, and then he was writing me letters and asking me to come help him in India. And so eventually, uh, I was playing music in Hawaii. I had no money, just getting by. And then I got hired by this guy to play in Alaska. And I played for a couple of months in Alaska, and they, pl they paid me this extraordinary amount at the time. And suddenly, I had several thousand dollars to go to India. So I went straight to India. I hadn't been to India on my first trip around the world. I was terrified to go to India because I knew once that plane door opened, it was going to be a different reality. It was going to be poverty like I'd never seen before. It was a possibility of getting very ill because everybody I'd met that had been to India had had incredible stomach problems and all kinds of conditions because I wasn't used to that, you know, Asian bacteria, a little bit, because I'd been to Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, but not India. So I was very frightened to go, but I knew I had to go. Just like my trip around the world, I was terrified. But for that reason, I knew I had to step in my, into my fear and conquer it, get through it. And sure enough, when that plane door opened, I was freaked out. <laughs> this is 1982, I guess. It was different than now. I haven't been there in a few years, but you know, it was uh, it was a new environment for me. First first day in India, though, I, I had an address. Cliff had given me an address in Bombay, an ashram to go to, go to, a Christian ashram, kind of linked to this Christian ashram that he was teaching at in Vagator Beach. And I got off the plane, and I kind of in complete culture shock. I jumped in a, a little uh, tuk-tuk and we found this ashram and uh, tuk-tuk pulled in. I traveled before so I thought I was a little street smart and I got out of the tuk-tuk and I said just wait here and I'm just going to check and see if this is the right place and if people are here and I took the, I thought I was really smart, I took the tuk-tuk guy's number and I left my luggage in the tuk-tuk. And I, I, you know, I started to run towards the ashram, and I, I thought about the number. It was like, the number was like 7,943,228. <laughs> and as I was running towards the, or walking towards the ashram, I thought, you may not see this guy again. <laughs> and that number, nobody's ever going to find that tuk-tuk again. And I turned around. Sure enough, he was pulling out with my luggage. And I ran back and caught the guy and grabbed my bag and sent him on his way. And so I, I did have some street smarts. <laughs> but still, I almost made a major mistake. <laughs> First minute in India. <laughs> so I went to this ashram and these guy, this, the, the priest at the ashram was there with a guy from the ashram that Cliff was t teaching at, young traveler. And they had like tea and cakes and cookies and they were waiting for me. They, they didn't know when I was arriving, but they expected me. And they said, oh, we've been waiting for you. And we had a little tea party. And suddenly I was in this, you know, very comfortable, beautiful environment. And then I walked out into the streets a couple hours later after hanging out, because we were going to go to Goa the next day. The, this guy, Simon, bought me a bus ticket. 
There was no planes. Uh, no, it was, a, yeah, it was a bus. There was the boat and the bus. The bus was 17 hours. Unfortunately, there was no seats available. So I had to sit on the floor. <laughs> but uh, that day, I, I ran into the marketplace, check it out. There was no tourists. This was outside of, kind of on, on the edge of Bombay. It was the poorest scene I'd ever encountered in my life. It was a, a very third world market. And I was uh, blown away, just wandering around the market. And this, suddenly I felt this tugging at my, my pants. And I, I looked down. It was a, a kid that, he was a kid, but he looked like he was 70 years old. He had an, a disease that had made him look like an, an old man. And he was asking for money. Of course, I, was, I wasn't hip. I, I saw this guy, and I, I thought, oh, i got to give him something. And I reached in and pulled out my wallet. Stupid. <laughs> And then I, you know, took a moment to look through my wallet. And then I looked up and I saw 30 kids running through the market at me. And I realized he was just the spotter for all these kids. And they were on me. And I had to, I had no time to give them anything. I had to run away. And they chased me through the market. And it grew into like 30, 40, 50 kids running after me through the market. And this police guy swung a, a club and tried to disperse them for, for a moment, and then they, they continued to chase me. Finally, I got out of their area and ran, ran back to another edge of the market, out of their area. And I continued to walk through the market, and, and people were calling me over, buy stuff. One guy was calling me, tea, come have two, tea. And I said, no, no. He says, no, no, we're not selling anything. Just come have some tea. So I said, okay. So I came over, and he was totally cool. He, said, he brought me some tea, said, would you like some cakes? And it was very poor. You know, it was, it was a very destitute situation, like I mentioned. And I, I took out some money to, get some, to give him some money for the tea and the cakes. He said, no, 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 no money. Just enjoy yourself. And then I saw how it worked. He was sending out kids to get some cakes, and he sent out another kid to get some tea, and they were all working together. And I saw that this was how they survived. They were all working together, taking care of each other. And it was a, an amazing experience, just that first encounter with this beautiful culture. Awakened. Everybody is high in India. You see more smiles there than you do in the West, certainly at that time. So it was this phenomenal experience of coming into this culture and seeing the beauty and the awakened state that people were in because they were living in the moment. They weren't struggling for their future. They were, they were concentrated on their next meal. If they had the meal, they were covered. They were completely present. So it was really a, a revelation that first day. So we've been talking about how, or at least I've been mentioning how yoga is about manifesting your dream, becoming a dream master, recognizing you can change your life any second, instantly. There's nothing stopping you except your own mind, your own fear. So if you've got a fear about something, you've got to step into it. And then you discover there's nothing to fear. So fulfilling your, creating your dream, fulfilling your dream is really what life is about. Yoga helps initiate that, I feel. Or all these other techniques that we're talking about, all these other shamanic initiation ceremonies around the world that have been created by our ancestors are designed to do the same thing. To give you an expanded awareness, a deeper depth of consciousness, a deeper depth of purpose. And also yoga is about aging and understanding the processes of death. And you know, it might be more about that than anything else. Maybe you noticed. Your 20s go by pretty quick. Some of you, most of you are in your 30s, maybe 20s, 30s. They go by even faster. The 40s really go by fast. <laughs> 50s go by like that. 
And you know, I told you I'm 92 now. The last 30 years, <laughs> it's, gone. it's been so quick, I can't believe it. <laughs> so everything passes really quickly. So there's no time to waste. Um, but they did this study on little rats that did yoga. No, actually, they didn't do yoga. <laughs> but they did, they did this study on rats. They took uh, two groups. And uh, one group, they let them eat whatever they wanted. And the other group of rats, they, had, they fed them a restricted diet. Um, so what do you think happened? <laughs> The group of rats that ate as much and whatever they wanted got fat. They aged over a long period of time. They slowed down pretty quickly while their little cousins who had this restricted diet were still energetic and booging along. And the group of rats that ha ate whatever they wanted Death was this long, drawn-out process, just like aging. They got older and older and slower and slower, and then death was a miserable, long process. Their little cousins, who ate what, uh, this restricted diet, were energetic until close to the end, a couple of weeks before they died. Rather than months and years, they aged, and then they slowed down, and they passed very quickly. That's the message I get from yoga. You, these are ancient prescriptions on how to age. This is more than, you know, just perfecting asanas. This is showing you how to have vitality your whole life, like Tatwala Baba and Patabi Joyce and Krishnamacharya. And how to have clarity, not lose your faculties, but keep getting wiser. Um, the Mayans have a word for old. In most Native American cultures, it's strong like a tree. Like David said in his story, when he was growing up, the older people weren't getting strong like a tree. They were deteriorating and losing their faculties, like we see in all over the world these days. Um, because of the, the bad food and the chemicals in the food and the loud noise and the bad news and the negative emotional patterns. But rather, your opportunity is to maintain these practices on whatever level you can each day and make yourself clear and strong and recognize that you can age with energy, that there's no from my experience, there's no peak in how strong you can become as you get older. Your strength, you might reach your peak in your mid-80s. There's lots of people that are like that, or even older. Remember, this is a, a movement that's never existed before. You know, yoga was in a small group of people in, maintained in India. And now it's a mass movement. Where I, I've been teaching in a lot of places for 30 years, or longer, coming back to places each year, and seeing my old friends getting stronger still, and healthier, and clearer. So you've got two choices. You can hang out in an old age home for the last seven or eight years of your life, being wheeled around by your nephew, or you can do yoga. <laughs> and maybe own the old age home. <laughs> One of my friends on Kauai, Denise Kaufman, she wants to start a, uh, uh, an old age uh, retreat for yogis. She's going to call it the last resort. <laughs> <laughs> so it's your choice how you want to age. Supporting organic agriculture, eating cleanly, Supporting local farmers in your community, encouraging your family and your friends to do the same is going to alter what's happening in the world. It is altering it. Um, the Tibetans say that at death, your clarity or your confusion is multiplied seven times. So, it's pretty intense. <laughs> you can think about that for a little bit. It's up to you how clear you want to be at your death. 
It's, it's going to happen, right? Apparently. <laughs> um, we don't know when. That's up to the Spirit. So, if you can do your meditation on death and what it means in, to you and to your, to your life, read how the ancestors describe it in their traditions, how mythology talks about it. In mythological traditions, they say that uh, there's, you know, whether it's uh, fairy tales or the scriptures or uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Anybody check that out? The, the original title of the Tibetan Book of the Dead was the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Through the, uh, uh, or uh, Sorry, it had another title. It was the Tibetan Book of the Liberation Through Hearing. The more contemporary book is the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. But the real translation was the Tibetan Book of the Liberation Through Hearing because it was read to somebody as they were approaching their death. It was whispered in their ear. And the Tibetans say that there's a 49-day period between lifetimes. Now, that you know, their, their days could have been eternities. <laughs> it's a metaphor for transition in the bardo. So this, this book, you can check it out. The contemporary ver uh, version is by Sogyal Rinpoche. It's, it's called The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. It's a very beautiful book. Very yeah, and uh, I highly recommend it. And read the ancient text, too, because it tells you, in metaphors, what happens each day af after your transition. On the first day, the second day, they say which... You could say which demons and monsters and nightmares you may encounter each day and how to overcome them. But only if you have some unfinished business in your psyche. If you haven't recapitulated in your life. If you haven't forgiven yourself or others for behaviors. If you haven't come to terms with what transition is about then you may go through this frightening period. Is there something you wanted to...? I was just going to say that um, in this transitional moment when Shanti passed, I immediately reached for that book. And she had gotten it in California, so I started reading it. It was really valuable for me. So look at that and be with her in the spirit form as she went through that body state. And there was so much communication going on in the wind. And she had some wind chimes. She gave us Tibetan wind chimes, which was really neat. She gave us she gave us Tibetan wind chimes as a wedding gift when she was at our wedding. And we hung those up and the wind would just make them sing. And there was so much communication going on through that that 40 day window. And they believe that in Bali too. And in India also too. Isn't that right? Yeah. There's like the same kind of window of time where there's a transitional stage. And it goes through that in the At death, it's already understood in modern medical science, but they've, been, uh, they've understood it for thousands of years in yoga and shamanism. I mentioned earlier, you, go, you enter into the experience in the super-awakened state. Even if you've had a, a suffering state before, in the moments before you tra make your transition, or sometimes days, but more often hours and minutes, this chemical is released into your brain. The strongest psychoactive chemical on earth. It exists everywhere in nature. It's been used in shamanic initiation ceremonies for tens of thousands of years, but it's also in your brain. So it releases and allows you to merge with divine consciousness. Whether you believed in it or not before, it's going to become very clear in your transition. You're going to merge with the force of the spirit. Your mortal consciousness fuses with divine consciousness. That's Kundalini. And then 
in this beautiful awakened condition, you make your transition. You, usually in those final minutes you can't speak, but you're having this visionary experience. It, like I said, it's been studied recently in modern medical science. They've started to recognize the existence of this chemical in your brain that awakens you. Um, in, this, in their studies that they've done, they've also discovered very recently, last few years, that in the fetus of a child, um, the pineal gland, which ha holds DMT, which is the seventh or sometimes sixth chakra, uh, is formulated on the 49th day after conception. So, and also in history, Descartes said that's the pineal gland is the seat of the soul. So the soul enters the fetus on the 49th day. That's the same thing the Tibetans are saying and have said for thousands of years, this 49-day period. So there's something that has been understood in ancient, these ancient technologies forever that verifies these fields of consciousness. This awakened condition where you enter into the spirit world. Now, if you haven't done your work, maybe, on uh, these ideas or meditating on the processes, you may not have overcome your fear of death. And so then, death can be a very frightening experience. And like you create your life, this is I've learned, I'm talking from personal experience here. I'm not making this up or <laughs> telling you from what I read. I'm talking about near-death experiences that I've had that I'll talk about in a moment, um, through shamanic initiation and also just an accident. You choose how you're going to die, just like you choose how you're going to live. If you have fear, you're going to manifest that fear. You're going to see all those demons and ghosts. You're going to end up in a in a bardo that's confusing for a short period of time. And then you're going to awaken and move into a deeper level of transition. But the initial transition is what we're talking about here. Whether it's going to be a fearful experience or whether it's going to be a beautiful experience. Um, one story uh, from Amazonian shamanism this old shaman was near death and all his friends and students came to his house to be with him in the transition. And they were all standing around his, his bed and <clears throat> he couldn't speak anymore. But one by one his, his family and students came up to him and looked him in the eye. They said, uh, you know, silent prayer to each other, and he would indicate a, an object from his, his collection to give to each person. And then they go back to the circle. So every, he, they completed that circle. Everybody said their thanks and prayers with their shaman. And he took his last breath. And as he took his last breath, one of the people in the circle came and took the breath and inhaled it. And they passed the breath around in the whole circle. And then the last person opened the window and blew it out into the universe. Other stories of people who had tremendous fear in uh, shamanic initiation ceremonies, being chased by a giant anaconda in their vision, because they had a fear of snakes. So they're being chased by this giant snake and terrified. And finally, no escape. They turned and faced the snake. Giant snake opened its mouth. In their vision, they jumped into the mouth of the snake. And they felt themselves being crushed by the snake. They could feel themselves going through the digestive system of the snake. And then, suddenly, they felt something moving under their stomach, and it was the earth, and they'd become the snake. 
And for the next couple of hours in this initiation ceremony, they traveled through the forest as a snake, seeing everything, experience, experiencing everything as the snake. And then they came out of their trance, back into their meditative state. And from that moment on, whenever they needed assistance or their guide, they could call their snake spirit helper. Uh, Don Juan, remember Carlos Castaneda? One of the first books on shamanism that really kind of turned on everybody in the 60s uh, by Carlos Castaneda. He says that death sits on your left shoulder. And if you look really quickly, you'll see it. It's always there. So once you know that, you know that you have to live every moment as fully as possible. Follow the guidance of the ancestors in whichever way you can. Explore what they have to say or what they've been teaching for thousands and thousands of years. Recognize that there's nothing to fear about death. That it's just transition. No ending. You're entering into eternity. Robert Thurman, you know him, the Buddhist scholar? He says, nobody gets out of here dead. <laughs> the shamans of the Amazon, the Tibetans, the yogis say the same thing. There is no death. If you look into the deepest scriptures, that's what they're saying. There's no death. It's just transition into another form. Your soul carries on. In a shamanic initiation ceremony, in the Amazon, I saw reincarnation. Now, you know, I, I, for some reason I knew that's what I was observing. I saw this orb moving through the universe. And then suddenly, at the speed of light, be transiting into another human form. Twenty years later, I read about it in a book called Shaman Healer Sage by Alberto Villoldo, where he, where he describes that process, where you're, everybody is carrying a luminous energy field. That's your soul. When you die, when, you, when your life force leaves your body, your electric, mag, electromagnetic energy releases your, your chakras from your spine into this orb. And it moves into the ethers until it's re ready for its next stage in evolution. So from that initiation ceremony, I recognize that this is very real. That karma is something that you experience, certainly at death. You run through your, a life review. And when I was uh, teaching yoga in Goa that first year, uh, I went swimming at Vagator Beach, kind of one edge of Vagator. Um, not big Vagator, if you know it, but the smaller Vagator Beach. And I was isolated on the beach. It was very quiet. I went into the water, and this jellyfish brushed across. Actually, it was a Portuguese man of war, brushed across my chest. I had no idea what it was. But I immediately felt trem tremendous pain. And I walked. I stumbled out of the water. Fortunately, I wasn't, it wasn't very deep. I was just shallow in the water. I stumbled onto the beach. I was naked, because everybody was naked in those days in Goa. And <laughs> I collapsed in the sand within a couple of minutes in tremendous nervous system pain. And I went into anaphylactic shock. You know what anaphylactic shock is? Your lungs stop working. You stop breathing. Anaphylactic shock kills you within four or five minutes. After two minutes, I realized I wasn't breathing besides this incredible pain I was going through and that my lungs had stopped functioning. And I forced myself to gasp. I gasped for air and then I held my breath. And this went on for four hours. couldn't move, I couldn't speak, I was writhing in the sand, in this pain, struggling to stay alive. 
this uh, Indian woman walked by that we knew that sold fruit, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and I couldn't say anything. I couldn't speak. And then she w- wandered down the beach, and she saw some of my friends. She said, I saw Danny on the beach. He's dead. <laughs> uh, my friends just figured, well, if he's dead, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> I think they went out to a restaurant. <laughs> But I, I was still alive, but I was in this deep state of shock. Now, the only reason I survived was because I'd been doing yoga at that point for six or seven years. I'd been doing pranayama for four or five years. So I had the strength to actually take a breath and open up my lungs just with my own musculature. After four hours of being in this condition, somebody sat down beside me and started talking to me that knew me. And I managed to turn to them and say, I'm in shock. Can you get help? And they realized that this was going on. They ran down the beach. They got a few people. They they grabbed me and carried me, threw something over me, a sarong, carried me to the road, which was about a mile away, and threw me in a taxi and told, told them to take me to the hospital. And after, this, so the dri- this driver saved my life. He took me to a couple, one, first hospital wouldn't take me. Second hospital took me in, and they gave me an, a- uh, an antihistamine shot. And I immediately came out of it. But I was still, you know, pretty unstable for a while. So I stayed in the hospital. And then I jumped on a motorcycle taxi and went back to Goa. And my friends saw me and said, hey, we thought you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> The next day, I didn't feel like doing yoga. We were teaching every morning. And Cliff said to me, what's the matter? Why aren't you doing yoga today? (laughs) I was in pain. I was still (laughs) trying to recover from that day. Anyway, in that experience, four hours in this near-death state, my life did flash before me. That, That thing you hear about your entire life passing, It's not your entire life. It's all the major events in your life that you haven't really kind of come to terms with or that were really, that really impacted you. That you may not have uh, analyzed at the time or recognized at the time or sometimes you you did. But that's what happens. It's not that you see your whole life in real time, these major events. I saw all the events in my life all the significant inv- events in my life at the same time. That's the DMT. This, this incredible psychoactive experience that allows you to see, like the Gnostics sa- say, like the Egyptians said, with the eyes of God for a short period of time. So you see everything at the same time. And then it allows you to review those events and recognize... And recognize, not, you're not punished for anything. Karma isn't about punishment. It's just consequences. You recognize how one action led to another action. That ha- every action has a consequence. And then you see in that life review how you could have behaved better. How you could have acted differently. Or how you did act in, in, a, in a beautiful way or a correct way. So that's what the life review is about. That happens, seems to happen to everybody who makes a, a normal transition not in a, you know, an accident that happens suddenly. Then the life review may happen after. But in that transition, that seems to be the experience. So you have an opportunity to recognize how your behavior could have been better. And that's what shamanic initiation ceremonies are about. They're not about recreational experiences. They're about the idea of initiating a death experience, like I told you uh, like the sweat lodge, or ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a South American medicine that allows people to come to the doorway of death and experience that life review before they die. So they can recognize how to process their karma, how to make radical changes in their life if necessary, how to forgive people that they, they might have been wronged by or 
how to ask for forgiveness from somebody that, they, that you may have caused harm to in some way, or just re-initiate contact with people that you may have broken off for some reason or another, or another if you haven't completed a cycle of behavior. So these things help you process karma long before you die. Meditation, pranayama, deep fasting. They're all techniques. Dancing, chanting, drum, drum ceremony, magical plant medicines. Sometimes they do Native American ceremonies, they do these uh, initiations that create a lot of pain. The, sweat, uh, the sun dance, you know the sun dance? They hook, they hook you with these hooks and they hang from these long ropes and just move into this deep trance state where they're going through the pain. They pass through the pain and they're in this deep altered state. Another worldly state another dimensional reality. Yoga recognizes that there's many, many levels of reality. Your eyes are only showing you one level of reality, but there are many, many levels. So your eyes are only telling you a tiny part of the story. The uh, initiation of tratika, is that what it's called? Tratika? Tratika. Tratika, where, you know, in yoga where you sit and you, you know, there's different ways they do it, but they sit and they observe a candle. It's a meditative technique. Right? You sit in a room or out anywhere, you're watching a candle, but you learn not to blink. Because blinking is a veil for the eyes. So, you know, it's hard to do at first, sitting like that. You might only be able to do it for 20, 30 seconds. But if you practice it, then gradually you can go for longer and longer periods where you can sit for half hour or 40 minutes and learn to sit and not blink. And you move into this deep trance state. It's a, it's a technique for initiating a trance. But it's also a, a Mexican shamanic initiation. Maybe you heard, heard of it, Arnie. Where you also, they do the same thing, but they do it slightly differently. The shaman will take his student to a street corner in Mexico City. And he sits on, the, he tells him, okay, sit on the street corner all day, eight hours, don't blink. And we're going to pick you up a little later and see what you saw. So the student sits there for all day in meditation, without blinking, and then later the, his uh, teacher picks him up and says, okay, how many people did you see who are disconnected from their soul? So, you know, these techniques broaden your awareness in a very profound way. And it's interesting that in yoga and Central American shamanism it's the same technique. So you can see there's all kinds of crossovers in what these characters have been up to for your ancestors. Okay, I'm going to just talk, chat about a couple other things and we'll take some, a few questions before we take a break. Um, healing is, is what we're all going through here. There's several levels to healing. The Tibetans call it the interdependent nature of all phenomena. In modern language, Caroline Miss calls it Biography becomes biology. So, everything you experience in your life, every day, every thought, everything you say, everything that's said to you, every loud noise, every bad news report you hear, everything that you experience through your senses is recorded by your nervous system. So, if you're in a situation where you're hearing bad news, loud noise, negative opinions and negative comments, it's impacting your nervous system. And at some, per at some point, if that's gone on for a long period of time or even a short period of time, it rises to the surface in the form of disease when your nervous system becomes overwhelmed with negative emotional patterns, stress, anxiety, fear, worry, jealousy, anger, rage, envy, all these negative emotional patterns initiate a breakdown in the immune system. 
cancer isn't a, a virus. You know, obviously it has a lot to do with all the chemicals we're carrying in our bloodstream. We're carrying hundreds of industrial chemicals in our bloodstream now. They've recognized that in the last seven years. That you're carrying 200 to 300 industrial chemicals in your bloodstream. And none of them have ever been studied completely because the chemical industries are supposed to be self-regulating. So they, they lie about their studies and they falsify the science, like I say, like I said earlier. And nobody knows what the combination of these chemicals is doing. But, but you know, through your own common sense, when you aren't doing yoga, when you're not eating properly, when you have these negative emotional responses, your immune system gets broken down and the chemicals <laughs> act on in your body and initiate disease, initiate cancer, initiate heart disease, asthma, lung conditions. So it's all these uh, combination of factors. But the doorway is negative emotional memories. The Hawaiians have a technique called Ho'opono Opono. Anybody ever heard of it? It's, it's, the definition is rectifying an error in thinking or behavior. Taking full responsibility. In other words, you sit quietly in a meditation and you ask yourself, how did you personally manifest this problem? Even if you think it was caused by a number of external factors. You say, how did I do this? You take complete responsibility for the situation. It's, it's critical self-awareness, essentially. In self-introspection. And you ask for guidance. You ask for, you petition the light. It's a petition to the light. Asking for correction. Asking for peace and guidance and tranquility and recognition of how to correct the imbalance. Hawaiian transi uh, Tr uh, tradition, uh, Mayan tradition, yoga tradition, it's all the same, essentially. Taking complete responsibility for the situation and then you receive information that allows you to turn that situ situation into peace. Whether you, you may recognize that this is it, you've got to die. You're not, you can't correct this behavior or this pattern or this result, but rather you can turn it into peace and recognize that it's your time for transition and make it a peaceful transition rather than fearful or remorseful or ter terrifying, but rather bring light into the situation. I like this metaphor from the Hawaiian tradition. They say Everybody is born with a bowl of light. And whenever you're angry or jealous or nasty to somebody, you, th you put a stone in your bowl. And you can, if you want, you can fill it up with stones. But at any moment in your life, you can take that bowl and turn it over and dump out all the stones. And you're left with your bowl of light. So you can start over any moment. Okay, at death, you recognize, you discover that all effect is created by thought. That manifestation is a result of intention and that intention creates reality. That's what you learn at death. All effect is created by your thinking process. Manifestation is a result of intention. And intention creates reality. These are, this is an ancient teaching. So, the idea is to learn that long before you die. <laughs> that you're manifesting your intention. What's your intention? Do you want to grow strong like a tree? gain energy and vitality as you age, fulfill your dream, become wilder, wiser, 
less domesticated as you get older or become a slave to a system? Do you want to influence people in a positive way? Help heal your community? Or the opposite? So, you're creating the dream. You're manifesting your intention according to how you think. The idea is to make that a reality long before you die. And I think most everybody probably is doing that already. We're just reminding ourselves of these things. Remember, there's no authorities. I'm frightened of all experts. <laughs> and especially in spiritual fields. Oh, God, <laughs> scary. It's not about following the guru. It's recognizing the, the shaman, the guru, like they say in, all, in shamanic tradition and the guru tradition. They just light your candle. They take you to a doorway. They open the door. And maybe they give you a kick. <laughs> But they don't enter with you. You're on your own. And it's the same in shamanic initiation ceremonies. Very powerful ayahuasca ceremonies, initiations into death. You may be, you may be struggling, you may be crying in these initiation ceremonies or in the sweat lodge. They don't come over to you and hug you and say, what's the matter? <laughs> <laughs> they might come over and say, hey, you want a glass of water? Are you okay? In the ceremonies I've been in, that's what they say. They say, are you okay? You're supposed to answer in the positive. No matter what your struggle is, you're supposed to say, I'm fine, boss. <laughs> and then go back and deal with your situation. But they make their presence known. One time I was in this amazing ceremony in the Amazon. And I got really sick. I had to go outside. I was throwing up. I felt terrible. They sent an 11-year-old kid who was also in the ceremony over to watch over me. His name was Juan, a beautiful character. And he came up to me and he said, same thing, you okay? I said, yeah. You're not going to say to a little kid, oh, please help me. <laughs> <laughs> you want to have some decorum? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm fine. <laughs> and then later he came, and then I, whenever I turned around, I was lying on the grass, I couldn't get up. I'd see him sitting there. He'd go like this. <laughs> I go, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and then he'd bring over a glass of water to me and say, you want some water? He just let, it, let me know he was there. Really evolved kid, obviously. So uh, that's what it's about. Coming to your own terms. Recognizing that death is nothing to fear. If you don't fear death, that guy sitting on your left shoulder, you can do anything in your life. You have to recognize, if you do yoga every day, like I usually tell people, first of all, you're adding 30 years of active energy onto your life. So you're increasing your time, right? And also, you uh, are speeding your day. You're going to sleep a little less. You're going to have, you're going to hang out at the bar a little less watch a little less TV, <laughs> you're going to recognize that you're creating more time in your day. You're going to accomplish your work faster. The clearer you are, the faster your work gets done. And a little later, you're going to quit your job. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, just, you know, no matter how much yoga you, you're able to do, try to give yourself seven, ten minutes just to absorb that energy. And then as time goes by, you'll allow yourself a little more time for yoga. As your body and energy become more refined, you'll sleep a little less. You'll have a little more energy during the day. You'll leave work early and all that. So, uh, you know, you create it somehow. You can manifest it. One of, one of my, uh, I was teaching in New York one time, and this guy came to my class, and he was the boss at a, uh, a business. And he'd started yoga. And then he thought, wow, this is amazing. I feel great. I, I'm getting sick less. I, you know, I show up for work more. He was the boss, though. So he decided he was going to gift all his employees, about 15 employees, yoga classes. And they just loved it. And then everybody was into yoga. 
So they all went to yoga together or, you know, did different classes. And, and of course, the result was they were sick less. He, they did their work better. They enjoyed their work better. And so get your boss into yoga. <laughs> I did an interview with the uh, Asian Wall Street Journal. It's on my website. And this girl was doing yoga. And she said, you know, it was in Japan. She was a Western girl working for the Asian Wall Street Journal. She said, the Japanese people work 16 hours a day. And if they don't work that, you know, if they don't want to work that long, they're only paid for like eight hours or sometimes they work 12, 14 hours, then somebody else will take their job. She was working also 14 hours. She told her, I, I said, just tell your boss about yoga. Tell him to try it. And she said, he would never do that. So anyway, she did an interview with me. And then he read the interview, of course, he was editing it. And he said, hey, that's pretty interesting. Maybe we should have yoga at the office, the Asian Wall Street Journal. So, you know, something manifests. You initiate something and tell your boss what's happening. Maybe you are the boss. <laughs> anyway, you know, you never know. You can initiate something that will radically change everything. When you look into the origin of yoga, if you read the Vedas, there's all these hymns to Soma. Right, Manju? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they talk about this visionary medicine, visionary tea that they drank. And there's all these songs to Soma and nature and uh, the spirits of nature. Manju knows them better than I do. But uh, in the Vedas, they say that was the origin of yoga. It gave the ancestors the vision of the practices how to meditate, how to breathe, how to imitate the animals and imitate nature and do yoga in nature. It's interesting because if you spend time in shamanic initiation ceremonies in the Amazon, they sing these songs during the ceremonies, the initiation ceremonies to the, these powerful visionary medicines. And the language of the songs they sing is the same as the Vedas. They're saying the same thing. They're, they're talking to the angels of air and water and, um, you know, recognizing their, the significance in our lives and how nature is the force that we have to tune into. It's like the shamans say, you can take dictation from a plant. You sit down and try it. <laughs> You'll get messages from a plant. But these things can't be taken lightly. They have to be done in sacred ceremonies. You know, the problem in the, in the 60s, like David was talking about yesterday, was, you know, you had the, the LSD came into, the, into Harvard, and it was used, you know, Sandoz Laboratories was supplying acid to the professors so they could do experiments with it and see what the effects on people's bodies and minds and initiate them into spirit. And by the way, you know, I don't know if you know the story of LSD, but it was created by Rich, um, Albert Hoffman, who was receiving the plant plants, the, in, uh, the first plants that were discovered by this Harvard botanist who spent a decade in, in Colombia hanging out with the various Indian tribes, doing the initiation ceremonies, and he would send the plant samples back, ayahuasca and other plants, to his friend in this laboratory in Switzerland who was looking at them scientifically and trying to imitate their qualities with the chemicals they had access to. And that's how LSD was born. So it was, you know, trying to imitate the sacred medicines of the Amazon. But, you know, he, like Albert Hoffman says, it became his problem child because they were initiating, you know, these psychologists and psychiatrists, Richard Alpert, who became Ram Dass, Timothy Leary, who they were very straight, brilliant psychologists and psychiatrists. But then they got turned on so much, they said, everybody should be taking this. But that's not the case. Everybody can't take it. And then they, they flooded the youth culture with it. And people were taking too much. They were drinking alcohol with it. They were going to parties. It's not about that. It was always done in very guided, sacred ceremonies in the forests where people were under the protection of healers. 
And once you're out of that circle and you take one of these medicines and go to a party and drink beer with it or take some other drug or mix other pharmaceuticals, you can kill yourself and people were killing themselves. Or you can have a very bad experience because you're facing your demons, you know, like we said, and not everybody's ready to face their demons. Or just like you have gurus who are not in it for your best interests or brujos, the sorcerers in the Amazon, there's the shaman and there's the brujo. The brujo is the sorcerer. He uses the medicines to manipulate and control people and maybe take your money or take your life. He's not in it for your best interests. He, he looks like it on the, on the surface, but he's not. You have to be very careful who you ex participate with. It has to be completely recommended by f somebody you know. It has to be a, if you're, if you're drawn to it, you can't just look on the internet and pick some guy in Cusco. <laughs> you gotta go with somebody you know who said, hey, I've been with this person, they're the real thing. They're in it for your healing, not for a power trip. Well, you know, you're not, concerning negative emotions, you can't get rid of them. You're going to be angry for periods of time or feel depressed or pissed off or jealous. But when it becomes a long-term pattern, when it's happening every day, or it happens all the time, or, or you, can't, you experience it and you can't stop it, then once you, if you, you know, like I'm saying, if you recognize that it's having an, an impact on your internal organs, and it, you know, it's, it's to the point where, like Caroline Miss, this medical intuitive, can tell you which emotion affects which organ, and, wi and which organ is going to rise to the surface with disease if you continue having that emotion. So, you know, you're going to be angry, but don't let it be a long-term thing. You know, don't let it carry on. Observe it, get rid of it, a end it. It's like, uh, you know, like we say with analysis, you know, or, or okay, you, you observe a situation. Human beings are great at this. They, they look at a behavior and they say, oh, God, why did I do that? And then later on they go, oh, why did I do that? And they just do that over and over again. The idea is to observe it, recognize it, maybe analyze it once, and then release it. So that's what yoga, I think, helps you do. It, you know, it, it helps release those toxic emotions, negative emotional patterns. You've got to do yoga, you know, do your practice every day. Heal yourself through the breath. Bring energy of the breath. It helps dissipate you know, negative emotional patterns. Patterns. They say that, they say that with pranayama you can remove your karma. Well, it brings you completely into the present and it shows you how to stop being stressed out and anxious. You know, getting rid of stress is something you've got to do instantly. We don't want to carry stress. That's the doorway, you know, to an anxiety, to worry, to disease. So, it's going to happen though. You're going to be worried for a moment here and there, but don't let it become a pattern. A uh, regular pattern, that's what I would say. When do you think the ego arises from? Well, well I think it's from your soul. You're born with an ego. Yeah. Your, your, your ego is your personality. And you can't get rid of it. But when your ego gets so big that you think you're, you know, hot stuff or you think you're a great yogi because you can you know balance on <laughs> two fingers <laughs> then your ego is getting in the way of what of the of the power of the spirit yeah. your your life is a gift from somewhere way beyond yourself so you know i know a lot of very well-known successful artists they were big they had big egos when they were in their 20s and maybe in their 30s, and then they realized, it's not me. I'm doing the work. I do the work, and I, I love the, the art, but the messages are coming through me. And I'm just, you know, using my uh, love of the art and, and um, work on the art, where they came to a certain level, because they love music or painting or whatever, or acting and being a vehicle for some very powerful, beautiful messages. For example, 
Cat Stevens, you know, who, Yusuf Islam. He, he, uh, he, I taught him some yoga and I became a little f friends with him. And he, he said that he, when he was young and he wrote those songs, those amazing songs that moved millions of people, he didn't know what he was saying. He, Bob Dylan says the same thing. He didn't know where it came from. He was just writing it down. And later, they started to understand it when they were more mature. They, they're all, they all say that. Anybody that has lasted in that, you know, the arts, recognizes that their talent comes from outside themselves. But initially, when they were young, they thought, oh man, I'm the, I'm the greatest. <laughs> I'm the most amazing. But then that blocks the connection, where it's really coming from. And then as they realize that more profoundly, then the messages get even more clear and deep. Or sometimes they lose the, the gift. You know, and a lot of, that happens with a, a lot of artists. You don't hear, a, if you don't hear from some artist that's, you know, maybe was very successful initially for a long time, they either got into drugs or drinking or, you know, started losing it and not taking care of themselves and they lost the ability to transmit that beautiful message. So you're, you can't get rid of your ego, but you can recognize that it's what, how big it is or how controlled it is, is up to you. Yeah, I got a letter, for, an email from somebody t uh, today or yesterday, and he said, uh, you know what, I, I, still, I'm still, I still have my job. Where am I going wrong? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to do it in a rational way. If, you know, maybe you have a family or you can't just necessarily quit your job and, you know, say to your family, I'm moving into the forest. <laughs> I'm not going to work anymore. We can't be sadhus necessarily. You're not meant to be, to give up everything. Maybe the odd person is. Uh, there's a new way to do it. Your way. You got to figure it out through your meditation, through your yoga practice, and initiate it slowly. If you're not satisfied and it's dragging you down in some way, th and you recognize there's, a, there's another way that you can come up with, you have to explore your imagination. Your, your imagination is a force of illumination of your soul. So when you get this idea that you can live a different way, that you can have a different dream, that you can make money in a different way, that's positive or that reinforces your dream, there's a way. Some radical way that you haven't necessarily thought of yet, that's in your imagination. So it's all part of this, you know, you're th through yoga, through healing, through increasing your vitality, through energizing yourself, through seeing where you're not satisfied, something will come up. You know, when I say You'll be, you, the yogis, and you, the more yogi you do and the more pranayama you do, the more unemployable you, come, you become. It, it means that, you know, sure, you may radically alter things, but you, you will employ yourself. You'll be doing something that you, you haven't thought of yet that is waiting for you. Uh, I love this story of, uh, did anybody see that film? Um, it's uh, about... Uh, it's about the brothels of Calcutta. Does anybody know the name? No, no, it was a different film. It was um, Born into Brothels. Okay? So it was this, uh, it won the Academy Award for Best Documentary about four years ago. I, I love this story because it was this girl that went to Calcutta. She had a couple hundred dollars, a Western girl, and she was into photography. So she just decided to buy cameras for the kids of the prostitutes who were all living in the brothel in this one area of Calcutta and teach them how to take pictures. So she spent about $100. She bought like 12 cameras, you know, inexpensive cameras. She gave them to the kids. She taught, taught them how to take pictures. This was when film was... I guess she taught them how to develop the film. And she just sent them out into the brothels wh where they were, wh they were hanging out there anyway. They were the children of the prostitutes. And uh, they started coming back with these amazing pictures. M meanwhile, she had a friend that was with her who was video videotaping what she was up to. 
So she collected all their pictures and as they developed them. And then somebody in Calcutta heard about it, somebody in it through the, a newspaper article. And they said, let's have a, a photographic exhibit of the kids' photos. So they had a, this exhibit. And it drew all these, the elite of, of Calcutta. You know, a lot of wealthy people came to the exhibits. There were some amazing photos. Still, she's filming this whole trip. And then she gets, somebody who is from Amsterdam gets, is there, sees the exhibit, and they invite some of the kids who have the best photos to Amsterdam to do a photo exhibit. So meanwhile, she's filming this, and they start cutting the film, and she gets this idea to, since they're drawing people with cash, to make a foundation, to contribute money to get ki the kids into schools rather than just going, becoming prostitutes. And she makes this movie, a documentary, and it wins the Academy Award. <laughs> you never know what you'll come up with, what's, what crazy idea is possible. Radically different from anything you've thought of before. Or maybe it's something simpler. There's a, there's a way. I just wanted to say one thing, spiritual warrior. I love the American definition, American Indian definition of spiritual warrior. Somebody who uses their life force to create a world of balance and harmony for coming generations on a continuous basis. Not just once, but all the time. That's a spiritual warrior. That's what you are by being a yogi. <laughs> So you're, like we said, you, your influence is immeasurable. What you're going to do in the future, nobody's going to be able to believe it. You never know who you're going to influence that's going to have an, another influence. 